All right, the riff. Now we're really getting into the stuff I don't remember in the comics. Don't get me wrong, I remember some moments from this, but it's mostly just panels that I have mixed feelings about. So when the face of the promise, which I ended up thinking was just pretty all right, and the search, which I found to be a pretty big letdown, let's see how the riff stacks up. So we start back up in Yu Dao, that town from way back in the promise, and I guess the start of last comic too. Katara kind of dressed to the nines here. What's the occasion? Oh, they're electing new legislature. Two men, two women, two Earth Kingdom, two Fire Nation. Seems like a good baseline to start with. Corey here, who is of course of both Fire Nation descent and Earth Kingdom citizenship is wearing both the nation's respective colors. And I mean, it clashes pretty bad, but I get the idea, Corey. So after the little ceremony or whatever, and oh my god, Sokka's looking good. Who dressed you? Get them an award. This new Air Acolyte kid has glasses, and don't get me wrong, there's eyewear in the original show, like Teo wears goggles, the Eclipse glasses, you know. But I'm having a hell of a time thinking of anyone that just wears normal eyeglasses. I don't think there is any. No, wait, I've thought of one. The Irredeemable Nerd from City of Walls and Secrets. And the Earth King has these reading glasses too. I think that's it. Feel free to overanalyze me on this one, but I think I got it. Anyway, what was my point? Spectacles are very rare. I think that was it. Aang gets flagged down here by a hooded air acolyte on the other side of the crowd and asks Jing here if it's one of her friends, which she says no to. Side note here, Jing is still wearing this headband of shame, and I like that. Aang seems like the kind of guy that would eventually be like, ah, nah, you're cool, the tattoos are fine, I guess. But I'm really glad he's taken up such a staunch stance on it here to be like, nah, if you're hanging around, you gotta cover that up. It's still disrespectful. So Aang goes to find the air acolyte, but can't seem to, so he pulls a Suki at the Boiling Rock maneuver. Aang catches up and says, hey, I'm Aang or whatever, hop on my air scooter and we'll get the hell out of here. And I'm just like, you can carry people on that thing? Like what, on your shoulders? But no, it turns out it's Avatar Yang Chen, the previous air nomad avatar, like seemingly in the flesh. The only other time we've seen a past avatar appear like this was Kyoshi at Chin Village when she was like specifically called out on her honor, and there was an effort to summon her. Every other time an avatar has appeared in the physical world, it's been in this ghostly spiritual form. So Yang Chen showing up like this is really something. It must be something important. Anyway, she says, ah, and then Ang's like, wah? And then she says, ah. And Ang's like, I mean, I can't. And then Yang Chen disappears, leaving Ang to be like, what the hell, man? Back at the party, the new government is sitting up at the dais here at the head of the room, Iroh sitting in the middle. Yeah, Iroh, you run this joint. That's goddamn right. I mean, maybe. I'm still not 100% clear on the whole government thing in Yu Dao. Sokka mentions this dish he's eating is really good, and it turns out it's turtle duck. Oh man. The conversation turns to tough school. No, no. Anyway, she says she has way more students now that metal bending isn't a myth anymore, but she says she's broke because she refuses to charge tuition. Because I guess she's just that good of a guy, or a terrible businesswoman, or both. Katara wanders off to find Aang, who was out here making it seem like he's meditating so fucking hard right now, which leads to the question, can you meditate with more effort involved? Is that a thing? Aang is meditating, focusing on the air pendant on his necklace, which is a good through line from the other book. And the necklace is even drawn to make it seem like the fire pendant is missing, which is nice, since Aang burned it off two books ago. Sea, air, water, then Earth would be down here probably, no fire, nice. Also, it seems like Aang just carries this other meditation necklace around, with him when he's not wearing it, since he's clearly wearing his other best airbender in the world necklace here, as he seems to do on formal occasions. Aang explains the situation to Katara, saying that meditation hasn't been going so hot in general lately, and Katara says, ah, oh, well, if you can't figure it out, you might as well come inside and have a good time, and Aang says, yeah, no, yeah, you're right, I am kind of the life of the party. Aang tells the air acolytes and the gang that they're going on an adventure tomorrow. The air acolytes are naively excited, and the rest of the gang are so seasoned at this point, the reaction ranges from uneasy boredom to just not listening. Smash cut to the next day, we're off on the adventure, thank god, not like some other books. For some reason, we rejoin the gang while Katara and Toph are berating Sokka about losing his bag, apparently. But not about losing it, about being sad about losing it. And they call it a purse, and they say they'll get a new one that'll match his belt, and what the hell, man? What's with the third degree? Accessorizing is very important. Ignoring my frothing rage at them giving Sokka a hard time for a moment, Aang explains that today's the day of Yang Chen's festival, an air nomad holiday, which is nice. Aang did have the express goal of sharing his culture at the end of the first book, so I like this beat. Aang explains the tradition in a flashback. You know, bow to the statue four times, walk down the cliff, eat, fly kites, it's your average air nomad holiday, you know. And a really nice touch that I like that these comics do is that it does the flashbacks in the same color palette that the show did. Like, all of the Fire Nation flashbacks were done in red, and just like the show, all of the flashback panels for Aang are done in green. Little subtle detail here, in the flashback we see both male and female air nomads, and of course we know the temples were split between male and female. So yeah, this had to be a pretty decent little gathering. Another really nice touch is that Aang is just silently 
a long gyatso in all of these flashbacks. It's never pointed out or anything, but it's there, you notice. So they show up to the statue, and Sokka says he figured it would be a statue of Yang Chen, but it's not, so who is it? And Aang says, I don't know, man. He was always too busy goofing off with gyatso to ever learn the actual meaning behind the holiday. Oh, well, that's probably gonna come back. They also say hello to this bird called a cranefish, which doesn't seem important, but one of the few things that I remember about these comics past this point is that it weirdly is, so keep that in mind. Sokka says, isn't it weird to be bowing to a statue when you don't know who it is or why it's there? Aang says that's just how it's done, which strikes a chord deeply with Toph suddenly. We get flashbacks for Toph now, which are done in the same color palette as Aang's, which makes it kind of less cool, but at the same time it would probably clash even harder than Cory's outfit to change the colors of flashbacks that we've already established to be this, like two pages after we see one, so I mean I get it, it's economical. This sentence sparks these memories in Toph's head because I guess that's something her dad used to say to her all the time. The custom she didn't understand, that's just how it's done. The role she had to play as a wealthy man's daughter, that's just how it's done. The etiquette she didn't care for at all, that's just how it's done. Being locked away from the entire world because of her blindness, that too, according to her father, is just how it's done. Another side note, Toph says she wants to play with these kids outside, but shouldn't her dad be like, how do you know those kids are outside? Side side note, where's this panel taking place? The Bayfongs have like a giant compound they live in. There wouldn't just be kids playing outside their windows, right? So this immediately sours the celebration for Toph. Doing something just because someone tells her to do it doesn't sound like her kind of scene. This is a bit of writing that I really like, actually. Toph explains her disinterest in the ceremony as Toph Beifong doesn't bow to anybody, which is the classic Toph bravado that we all love. But at the same time, it calls back to notes from The Runaway, where Toph acted out with the same attitude, trying to be free because her parents were so suffocating in the past. Aang saying that line put Toph back into that mindset, and asking her to do something just because it's tradition right after, well, that's just not gonna work. This is well executed writing to me. This is a beat we know from the show, and since we're so early in the comic, it's clear that we're going to tackle this problem with Toph. It's like the exact opposite of the Aang promising to kill Zuko thing. The show clearly told us how Aang views the world and that problem, and immediately doubled back on it with no setup, and then we spent the rest of the book trying to get back to where we started. Here, we revisit a beat that, while explored in the show, was never truly resolved, and we're seemingly going to move forward with it, which I like a lot better. Anyway, despite me getting where Toph is coming from here, she is less than graceful in telling Aang she's not taking part, directly insulting the tradition, saying that if it hasn't been celebrated in a hundred years and the world hasn't ended, then who cares? Why do we need to celebrate it? Of course, one of Aang's few sensitive spots is his culture being disrespected, but extremely tactfully says that this is a learning experience for the Air Acolytes, saying that as Air Nomads, we should just let insults pass us by and move on, and even gets a dig in at Toph for being disrespectful. Masterfully played, I must say. Anyway, the Air Acolytes are pumped. That was the best bowing experience they've ever had. Done with the bowing, so on with the marching, and Toph is still really not vibing with this whole experience. Like, I get where she was coming from, not wanting to bow, sure, but then there's also being a good friend and just putting up with something for the day. Like, sure, Toph is bullheaded and not the most empathic character, but telling me that Toph wouldn't have the social awareness to realize that this means a lot to Aang is starting to border on the very unnuanced characterization that I've had problems with in the previous books. And it's clearly starting to get to Aang too, understandably. And just to twist the knife even more, the meadow that they were supposed to picnic in has been replaced by this town that looks like it was built just to rub Aang's face in it. So they roll into town and Aang's super not about it. There's even the smell of barbecue permeating the place, just to stunt on Aang even more since they were supposed to eat a traditional airbender meal here, and Sokka and Toph take off to go eat. Someone calls up to Katara, and it's Neok. Classic Neok, of course, Neok. Uh, no, she's not in the show. I don't know who this is. Neok? Neok? I'm going with Neok. She's apparently from the Southern Water Tribe and hasn't seen Katara since she left. Weird though, Neok seems like she'd be only a couple years younger than Katara here, if younger at all, and we didn't see any girls even roughly Katara's age in the show. They're here to work at the refinery. Then Neok's sister calls to her, whose name is Nutha? Nutha? Just another gal from the Southern Water Tribe? We'll go with Nutha. Neok and Katara share a strange glance after Nutha ignores Katara, weirdly. And then we just move on. It's a really weird moment. Aang sees a more blatantly spectral form of Yang Chen who says, ah before leaving again. The gang follow the ghost of this gated off area. No problem, says Aang. I'll simply launch you over with earthbending. I don't know why Katara can't just fly them over, but you know, everyone in my comments said it wasn't a big deal. It doesn't unground the magic system at all, leading to little plot holes like this all over the place. No, it doesn't do that. So we're in this polluted hell area now, and Aang is not very pleased that a place his people used to call sacred is being used as a waste let off for some refinery. Right on cue, the guards show up and tell them that they don't care Aang's the Avatar, he's trespassing, so it's time for the middle of the comic action scene 
scene, Katara immediately goes to throwing the green polluted water at the guardsmen, and I don't know where it is in the papers, but that's gotta constitute as a crime against humanity somewhere. Aang resolves the situation by doing honestly the most cartoonish thing in Avatar since episode 2. He tells the air acolytes that this is another lesson, then he lets all the guardsmen run at him, and then he jumps out of the way and lets them all bonk their heads together like this is an episode of Scooby-Doo. And yeah, okay, I get it, he was trying to show off some air nomad thinking to the air acolytes, but still, really? Everyone's like, yeah, that was crazy, Aang, great move, even this guy over here, whoever he is. Oh, it's Satoru, I think I got that one, Satoru sounds right. Also, Satoru wears glasses, seems like it might be a new fad or something. Turns out Satoru is a big fan of the Avatar, which makes sense, he should have some good PR lately. So, introductions, introductions, turns out Satoru is the engineer of the refinery, which is why the guard should have checked with me before they attacked you like that? Really? They have to check with the engineer before they do their job? Satoru continues to fanboy over Aang as he asks to talk about where this refinery is located, except Psyche's not fanboying over Aang anymore, he's an even bigger fan of Toph, who happens to be walking by in this supposedly fenced off area. Why are you guys here? What, did you jump the fence? Satoru says, oh god, can I show you my refinery? It's all I got to my name and I really want to impress you. Toph says, sure, Satoru, to which she shouldn't know his name since she wasn't here when he introduced himself. Aang has a tinge of jealousy in his dialogue here, or maybe irkedness. He's at least irked at Jason. From Toph dismissing all of his traditions and then seeming to fit in so well in this environment that dismisses all of his traditions. Sataru welcomes the team to Earthen Fire Refinery. Really, Sataru? That's the best you got? Well, it makes sense on the level that the war is over, at least, and the two nations are working together. There was even a little hint to that on an earlier page, as you can see here. The logo for the refinery is a mashup of both the symbols for the Earth Kingdom and Fire Nation. Sataru continues the tour, just enraptured with Toph, and Aang can't get a word in at all to talk about how this land was sacred to his people. There's also this background gag where Katara ganks Sokka's last bite of food, which is nice. It's hard to capture the same level of life and energy the show had in illustrations, so background stuff like this is a welcome addition for me. They got waterbenders working here too. I guess water, earthen, fire refinery would change the name from hitting the ear like a brick wall to hitting the ear like a train crash. Seems like Sataru is harvesting these glowing crystals this land is abundant in, and like, there were glowing crystals in the show, don't get me wrong, but these have this weird cartoon radioactive glow, and with the toxic runoff from earlier, it really makes it seem like Sataru's out here mining raw uranium or something. Sotaro shows them an even better production line, and Sokka lets fly maybe the worst line in Sokka history. Okay, my mind has officially been blown. Erm, you refine all this earth with these machines? Okay, I guess that's just something you do now. So here we finally get to one of the themes and big questions of this book, or at least it's more in your face about it. Sotaro explains that these machines are more effective, and it doesn't take being a bender to work here because of them. Sotaro is looking to the future, to progress, and much like how his refinery sits on sacred airbender ground, his business is pushing past the needs of benders to get things done. Here we get that famous scene of there just being a forklift in Avatar, that a lot of people seem to take great offense to for some reason, I never got it. Avatar has had tanks since season 1, the drill in season 2, but I think those get a pass because they look weird, right? They don't look like stuff we have in real life. This forklift is just a forklift, but the level of technological advancement in Avatar has always been anachronistic. Now the big question is, does the existence of a forklift imply an internal combustion engine? Because that, from what we've seen, would be a big leap. All the tech we see the Fire Nation use is coal or steam powered, so having a straight up engine would be pretty wild, but I don't think most people are thinking that way when they see this. And crazy theory here, I think this forklift might be here so that you side with the characters. This forklift seems so out of place with the reader who is familiar with the world, of course you're gonna be like, what the hell? But think about what the characters are feeling at this very moment. They're being led through this high tech facility and being shown how the status quo is changing and they're uncomfortable with it. Just like you are when you see this fucking thing. I don't think this moment is as weird or as clunky as everyone says it is, I think it's on purpose, and I think it accomplishes exactly what it's going for. Whether it's a good overall addition to the Avatar universe, that's still up in the air. So Sokka crashes the thing, of course he does, that's a whole course you gotta take Sokka, you gotta get certified. Speaking of which, this whole place is a giant safety violation. Where's your PPE? You can't bend with gloves on? I don't believe it. These guys should be wearing respirators, they're crushing up rock all day in an enclosed environment, come on. Hearing protection isn't mandatory on the floor, are you kidding me? Where are your toe boards? Anyway, this smoke to me does imply engine, making Satoru, the most gifted engineer in the Avatar world by like one light year. That's pretty insane. Toph says, step aside, I can fix it. Oh my god, I wrote all that other stuff before getting to this panel, obviously. That's just an engine, right? And like I said, it's not totally out of the realm of possibility or anything, but it is a big leap to just be like, yeah, Satoru's got one of these, it's not a big deal. But I guess if we look forward to Korra, there is an entire, like, industrial revolution that happens over the course of these guys' lives, so... Toph fixes it up no problem, so Satoru floats the idea of Toph and her metal benders teaming up with a refinery to help 
out in return for the refinery funding the construction of a new building at her school. Top figure she'd love to be in a partnership with Satoru. She means, uh, the refinery. Never a dull moment around here. Ghost Yang Chen shows up again and let's fly her classic catchphrase of, uh, Aang gets a vision of this gnarly fucking gorilla shogun looking spirit destroying what from the metalwork and smokestack seems to be the refinery, which is an avatar power that hasn't ever been shown, a vision of the future. Interestingly, it's shown to us in purple, which is the color of the final crown chakra, which is the one that deals most with the weird spiritual universe energy that Patik lightly touched on. So I like that it's shown in purple, if it is a weird vision of the future, and Yang Chen somehow gave Aang this vision. It's clearly through this weird universe energy that they both have a connection to. Aang, however, isn't clear if this vision is of the past or future. I guess he must have missed the smokestacks and stuff. I mean, there is a giant gorilla shogun thing to focus on. He takes this as a real sign to tell Satoru he shouldn't be making any business plans with Toph. In fact, he wants him to shut this whole place down. Toph immediately speaks up and tells Aang to lay off. No one was using this land in the last hundred years. Aang can't tell him to shove off just because his people used this land before. Aang tries to tell Toph that something bad is going to happen and that bad things are already happening. Look at the pollution. So we're revisiting ideas from two of my least favorite episodes from the show, those being the Northern Air Temple and the Painted Lady. I do think here though, so far at least, it's being executed much better. You can see more of where Sitaru isn't so much in the wrong because he didn't defile any temple or anything. He built a town in a field. How was he supposed to know? And the runoff from this refinery, while bad, is runoff that's going towards progress and not a horrible war effort, and it's not directly negatively impacting anyone at the moment. So while the reader can definitely see where Aang is coming from, that this place isn't the best thing to ever happen, we don't see Sitaru as a villain. It's more nuanced, which I like a lot. More to that point, Sitaru says the river being green isn't because of his refinery. His uncle figures it's a natural occurrence, to which everyone says, oh, come on, man. But Toph lie detectors him, and it turns out he's telling the truth, or at least he thinks he is. But Satoru gives Toph a bit of a knowing look here. I think it would be interesting if Toph herself was lying here, and Satoru wasn't telling the truth, because Toph is clearly into Satoru, and also into the business venture they just thought up. I don't think it'll go that way, but just a thought. Aang pulls Toph aside and says, listen, I know you're into Satoru, but you can't let that alter your perception of him. Aang implies that he's fallen into that trap before as well, which I wonder what he's getting at. Like, is dating Katara not all it's cracked up to be? You seem pretty in love up until this point. Toph tells Aang to shut up, basically. This place is exactly what Aang's been working toward. People from all different cultures working together. This place is the future. And she's got a good point, but now we revisit that worry Aang had back in the promise of the progress he's working so hard to achieve, leaving his way of life behind. Once again, I think really good writing. A genuine internal dilemma Aang has with himself at the end of one book is manifesting as a larger external conflict in this book. That's really good. So Aang finally snaps, which has been really well built up to. Every time Toph speaks in this book, it's either something she knows Aang disagrees with or is directly putting Aang down. So it feels really earned, but suddenly the ground starts to shake. Everyone thinks Toph and Aang arguing is what caused the earthquake, which is really cool, actually. The thought of that kind of harkens back to Katara's emotional waterbending in book one. But I mean, these two are both masters at this point. They probably wouldn't have that happen to them. Still a cool idea, though. Aang explains it wasn't him and accuses Toph of doing it, to which Toph says, what the hell, man? You think I'm some kind of amateur that can't control? And then we get another earthquake. Everyone seems to be fine out here, but the gang realizes that, oh, the earthquake was probably far more dangerous to be in the safety infraction riddled refinery for. And oh yeah, they're right. Rescue mission now suddenly as one of the machines goes haywire. Toph and Aang put their continual headbutting for the whole book to the side to do some good, which is a nice moment. It's good to see no matter how stubborn Aang is being and how insensitive Toph is being, they can still homie up when it counts. So Toph smashes the hell out of the machine and the danger is subverted pretty quickly, actually. In a moment of clarity, Aang and Toph get to speak more plainly to each other. Toph asks if Aang thinks he's trying to hold on to the past too much, and Aang asks if Toph thinks she's trying to run away from it too much. Which is, hate to admit it, names overanalyzing Avatar and all, an angle I've never really thought of. That's a really good point, something I probably should have thought about back in those flashback panels earlier. Aang still holds his past life in such high regard, and Toph wants nothing more than to pretend her past life never even happened. That's a wonderful little juxtaposition, I'm way into that. No time to really push the idea though, that's for parts 2 and 3 I guess. Our Z-list villains, the Rough Rhinos are back. The Rough Rhinos, you don't say, how you guys been? Turns out they're the personal security for Satoru's uncle, who runs the refinery with him. Who just so happens to just return to see how Toph brutalized their machinery. Satoru asks if Toph couldn't have just unplugged it, and Toph must be like, unplug it? What do you mean? What does that mean? Satoru's uncle, very unpleased with the situation, calls in their business partner, Lau, who just so happens to be Toph's dad. Whoops. Seems like how Aang is dreading things from his past being so different, Toph is gonna have to deal with things from her past probably being exactly the same. And that's the Rift Part 1, and I gotta be honest, this might be the best volume of the Avatar comics that I've seen. It has a couple of really interesting conflicts, and it's all written really tightly. The conflict in the world, that being the town taking over Aang's land, plays beautifully into the more character-centric conflict of Aang and Toph, and Toph with her own past. It's executed really well. It also sets up some really good mystery, too. Why is Yang Chen showing up? Why can't she speak?
speak? What is that vision that she showed Aang? It's all really interesting. It does fall into the same thing as previous comics, where only really one or two characters get to shine. This time it's Aang and Toph. But it is a limitation of the medium in itself. It's just, I wish our characters could really bounce off of each other like they used to in the good old days. Rather than Sokka and Katara getting a nothing line in here and there. The action, like most times in these comics, unless it's the final confrontation of the book, feels pretty forced. I like the idea for the earthquake sequence. It's an interesting idea to see how benders would deal with a natural disaster, but it ended up being pretty short, and the guard situation was pretty laughable. I'm gonna have my gripes. It's an overanalyzing video. Nothing's ever all positive. But this one, in the end, was genuinely good, and leaves me with high expectations for the rest of the book. Patreon shoutouts if you want to see two brand new videos from me. You can support me on Patreon for just a few bucks. Link, as always, is in the description below the video. Biggest shoutouts of all go to my top patrons, Agent Rhino, who can win any fight as long as there's classical music playing. Freebird counts as classical in this case. Danger Stranger, who won a demolition derby while on foot. Fat Houdini, who can send faxes with their mind, only in Helvetica though, unfortunately. Omega Fighter, who can, rather than throw his voice, can throw his hearing. Sean Martin, who as a kid boxed the monster under his bed to a standstill, so the monster in his closet just bounced. Stephanie Riches, who unlocked four-wheel drive while on foot, and it's just horrifying to look at. Thomas Lautenbach, who can cancel tidal waves. Tiago Nascimento, who was chosen as champion of Earth in Galactic Polo, water and otherwise. Tiz Just Lee, who has the uncanny ability to stop giant squids evolving to come on land just by thinking about it, and thank God they do. Varunda, who was able to have other parts of their body boggled other than their mind, which is a feat here too unheard of. And Whitrow, who used an AI to make an even better AI, which is programmed to make an even better AI, which then, oh wait, that's not good. And of course, my god overanalyzers, Two Boots Are Beat, Andrew Watchett, Austin Gallup, Daniel Anderson, Dizzy Payne, Dominic Saint, Distant, Aaron Grace, It's Carton, Jackson, John Ajaka, Justin Fletchall, Mr. Freese, Nicholas Abbott, Peter Bayron, Phil, Pogger White, Reese, Rocket Mist, Ryan Maxwell, Samuel Vanderplatt, Super Snipper, Turk Bobs, and the Bearface. Next up, if it's not part two, I'd be surprised.